welcome, as Christiana said, um, episode number five. This time, everything about these things called DAOs, um, really an awkward name, uh, honestly, in the end, uh, decentralized autonomous organizations. We're going to break it down a bit. Um, like all the other episodes, uh, there is this pattern. Um, I get to kind of give you a lay of the land from the PowerShift ecosystems perspective, just kind of how we see things. Um, luckily, we have two partners with us. We have Boris Pikolov and Christiana, of course. Boris is here, um, a new member of the PowerShift.io um, uh, uh, enterprise and all of our work there, but not a stranger at all um, to blockchain decentralization, securitization. He's a co-founder of uh, um, Stobox, a uh, leading security token provider, uh, legal compliance tech stack provider. So Boris is a deep dive in this subject. It's great to have him on this call uh, to hang out with as well. So um, my job is to kind of give a, a survey, as I said, a lay of the land so that we can break out into smaller discussion groups and dig deeper. Um, so I'm going to start just kind of how I see the DAO space, um, how I see status quo, um, my experience with it over all these years. And feel free to ask questions as we go along here too, of course. Uh, but the, the goal is to kind of just set up, set us up for the breakout sessions here in you know, the next 30 minutes or so. So uh, with that, let's kind of step into it. Um, first of all, we're talking about the PowerShift, um, the PowerShift ecosystem. This is now familiar territory, of course. The PowerShift ecosystem is comprised of three things or three stakeholders. This will be important actually to DAOs. Um, kind of in the end, the PowerShift ecosystem is all about the DAOs as a collection of individuals, enterprises, and purpose-aligned communities. Um, these are the three stakeholder groups that are both uh, constitu constituent parts of the ecosystem and beneficiaries of the ecosystem. We are all member partners, power shifters, um, citizens in the, in, in the future uh, as we march towards the network state. So the power shift ecosystem is this amalgamation of individuals, all of us humans, some of us associated with various enterprises, and some of us uh, associated with other purpose aligned communities. Um, had some great conversations with other purpose aligned communities just this week talking about how can we activate uh, community to community connections, uh, not just individual to individual connections. We've been exploring that territory, all of us on this call for a very long time. And um, of course, the interplay between businesses, um, organization to organization relationships or enterprise to enterprise, but also community to community, post, uh, sociocracy to holacracy, um, Gaia Net to um, Loki, um, purpose aligned communities, uh, cohere to cabin. Um, how do we create these meshwork of even bigger whole ons, whole parts? So we're playing with all of these constituent parts in an ecosystem and endeavoring to anchor the interactions and the relationships in clearly defined rules, right? This is the, the, the cornerstone of power shift is to make um, the implicit explicit. We're all familiar with that old, old, mantra. Um, and then in, in doing so, we redefine um, the essence of what it means to collaborate to get work done. So here we are once again in the PowerShift ecosystem talking about these funny little creatures called DAOs. And what the heck is a DAO? Well, it's different too. Um, mm -hmm. They've been around for a bit. Um, actually, they emerged in the mid 2000 teens. And I have a timeline. Um, <clears throat> we're going to understand the principles of DAOs um, and how they kind of kind of work and how they intersect the the PowerShift principles for sure, and then um, the future where we're going to kind of set up set us up for our breakout discussions. So with that, let's look at this timeline and linger here a bit. <clears throat> let's see what's been going on in the DAO space for the last what eight years. Um, so it's been eight years, I cannot believe it, 2016. So I was at a, a decentralization conference, the D10E conference, if anybody remembers that beast, 
D10E was exploring all things decentralized. I was in Bucharest in um, May-ish, May, June um, of 2016, talking about decentralization and governance. I was on a panel uh, talking about governance way back then. Very immature, very nascent topic. Uh, still kind of nascent, I think, but uh, even more so in 2016. And the breaking news of the conference, the buzz of the conference was this thing called the DAO. And it was literally the DAO. It was like the first decentralized autonomous organization running on the Ethereum blockchain. And um, it was kind of the work of Vitalik and some others to start modeling what it would be to collect uh, resources for some type of work. And um, like all things blockchain and hyperbole and uh, market um, irrationality and market exuberance, the DAO raised $150 million in what seemed like overnight in an instant. It raised 150 million USD worth of Ethereum in an instant around May of 28, uh, 2016. And then promptly in June of 2016, June 18th to be exact, there was the great hack. And Boris and several others will of course remember this event. And this was the talk at the conference. It was like, holy cow, uh, we just collected 150 million USD and on June 18th, 50 million of it vanished, completely vanished, hacked. And it was like, talk about throwing ice water on a whole movement, right? <laughs> so um, one of the upsides of blockchain is scaling. It scales a lot of things very fast, even fast ahead of its time fast, like raising capital, like it did here. And so everybody was intrigued, enamored by the ability to raise money um, in these structures, but immediately got hit right squarely in the face with one of the downsides, uh, smart contract security, hackability, and uh, the, um, the risk of putting your money in a system that has not yet been truly tested. So that was the big headline, of course. But the other thing that was a, a niggling little uh, tension of mine is like, what the heck was the DAO doing anyway? Right? So I'm all about organizations and organizational purpose and organizational work and pursuing something in the world. And this seemed really nebulous to raise $150 million to do what exactly? <laughs> and the what exactly is, uh, was even stated on the surface. It was to collect funds to pursue other um, blockchain-related initiatives, almost like an investment capital fund right, to be deployed by the investors. And so we're going to raise a bunch of money and we're going to de then deploy that money in hopes of leverage. Talk about a pyramid scheme <laughs> back in the day. It was uh, leverage a bunch of money in something that's really ill-defined to invest in more things really ill-defined that might raise even more money for the early, the early members, right, the, the top of the pyramid on the pyramid, pyramid scheme. Anyway, uh, long story short, um, that was my first introduction to the DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization. Um, but it got off to a really rocky start, uh, of course. But then, like all things, uh, began to mature up and find its legs. In 2018, um, just at the beginning part of the DeFi world, um, there started to emerge a more mature um, approach to DAOs to do something in the world. So 2018, I think one of the, the um, milestone launches was of MakerDAO, and it was intending to create these stable coins. The, the concept of a decentralized stable coin was, was new. We didn't have like USDC or Tether or any other stable coin. We were all using these wildly fluctuating uh, tokens um, as fungible uh, currencies. And of course, they didn't operate as fung fungible currencies. I mean, I have the own, my own pizza story experience. I literally, I've got the transaction record to show it. Uh, I, I paid Peter Kessels, actually, to make it super concrete in Vienna to make it even more concrete for a schnitzel, <laughs> a lunch <laughs> in a Vienna cafe. And I think I paid Peter, I don't know, um, was a 
half a block, uh, half a Bitcoin at the time. <laughs> it was maybe, you know, 30 or 40 bucks. I forget what the, the, the amount was, but it was, um, I paid in Bitcoin. Um, so I had my own little um, pizza um, experience, the, 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 the story of, you know, buying a pizza with Bitcoin for, uh, what, 10 Bitcoins back in the day, it was like five bucks. So uh, let's say it was five Bitcoin, so 25 bucks. So, and we all know five Bitcoin, even today after the booms and bust cycles, what is it today? 52K USD. So five times 50, 52,000, that's a quarter million dollar pizza that person bought in today's, today's funds. So you can't use these um, currencies, um, these uh, investment currencies or securities um, in a way that you'd use um, a, like a fungible um, um, fiat uh, currency. So um, to address that tension, there was a whole bunch of work in creating stable coins. And that was in 2018. <clears throat> um, I'm going to talk about some of the downsides of DAOs here in a second. Um, the, the, the primarily around these um, being these free, um, free form, not grounded in any legal jurisdiction or context structure that can scale super fast. There's a lot of innovation possibility here, but very little grounding into current reality. So that is a deficit too. And good on the uh, state of Vermont in the US who kind of stepped up to the plate <clears throat> shortly after in the 2018 period and started to modify their legislative code for business entity types to recognize DAOs as a legitimate business entity type. And so this was kind of the, uh, the beginning of maturing up a DAO as a legal entity, because it, up until that point, um, all DAOs were simply just um, general partnerships. They were just anybody that had an idea and could mint a token as a way of capitalizing that idea, um, and then enticing or seducing or otherwise coercing individuals to connect their wallet to that idea on the blockchain was all of a sudden a DAO. And with no legal standing, no ability to write a contract that was binding, full exposure of all wallet holders for any liabilities caused by this project. So it was literally the wild, wild west. It still feels very pioneering, but not quite as wild, wild west-ish to use US terms um, as it was um, back in even 2018 and 19. So then 2019 uh, was kind of a, the emergence of DeFi and a more mature version of a DAO. And I think the, the pivotal thing here, um, lots of experiments with decentralized finance, of course, um, amazing experiments. Um, but the, the focus is on uh, outcomes, pursuing outcomes, projects with uh, very defined outcomes to reinvent um, loaning um, and leveraging. Um, assets, uh, like a bank would, to be a bank replacement. And such great promise with decentralized finance. But then it got over uh, its skis, as they say. It got ahead of itself. And uh, a lot of very undesirable things happened in the DeFi market between 2019 and 2021, 22. It was really the, the impetus be, uh, behind the, the next major round of um, boom-bust cycles. And, but at that, that time, 2019, it was kind of the end of the ICO era. Uh, a lot of companies were raising capital, um, kind of uh, putting a finger, <laughs> uh, the middle finger, quite frankly, to the regulators and saying, you know, we don't need your Reg D offerings. We don't need to register as securities. We have these initial coin offerings that we're very happy to sell people who want to invest in our project with no regulatory requirements or compliance. And I know a lot of folks, uh, fellow entrepreneur friends of mine who funded their projects with ICOs, raised multiple millions of dollars, again, in what seemed like overnight financial raises, um, only to be um, greeted with knocks on the door some years later by the regulators saying, hey, you know, when you raise that 5 million with that token, um, that was an unregulated security. And you're in violations of securities laws, A, B, C, and D, with penalties of X, Y, and Z, and we're coming after you. And so the regulators said, um, 
we want back in the game to kind of corral this wild, wild west and protect the investors. So this is how it goes, right? This is technology. This is evolution. This is boom and bust. This is um, innocence and uh, maturing processes as we, we move along. And so you can see in this timeline, 2021 now, um, again, to the good credit of some jurisdictions in the, the U.S. and also elsewhere in, in the world, and I'll have a list of those here in a second, um, the legislative bodies, the regulators started stepping up to say, hey, okay, this is a thing. This isn't going to go away. This is innovation. This is the further innovation of um, a decentralized finance and banking in the form of DeFi DAOs. <clears throat> so the state of Wyoming, um, Tennessee followed shortly thereafter, and Utah just very recently um, all changed their legislative code to recognize DAOs as a legitimate form. And um, I'm particularly fond of the Wyoming DAO LLC and really familiar with its legislative code because I have formed, I don't know, a half dozen or so Wyoming Dow LLCs through their maturing. They've been through le two legislative cycles and they've amended the code at least twice. Um, and I'm gonna show you some examples of how we weave that into the Dow to make this a little bit less abstract. I'm gonna show you how we actually weave all this together. But the Wyoming Dow LLC has been uh, for us a boon. It's like the, the the regulators and the legislators are catching up to make it safer now to contemplate scaling up with these decentralized autonomous organizations. And so in this map, um, we see some reemergence 2021 and 2022. I think one of the interesting ones, uh, it got a lot of press, was uh, mainstream recognition of something called Constitution DAO. Um, Constitution DAO was formed, what, in 2021? Yeah, 2021. And it raised um, 47 million US from a group of investors who wanted to buy one of the original um, copies of the US Constitution at auction. And I thought that was, you know, an interesting sort of purpose and a model of how a group, a local group with a common interest could pool resources in a coordinated way to actually do something in the world, to affect something, to maybe preserve and take stewardship of a document in this case. Um, who knows what the underlying principles were beneath the purpose. Um, but I found that fascinating and they could marshal um, resources at this scale, at this speed. Now they were not successful in the bid. And what happened was in, instead of it blowing up, and people being sued and people losing their, their life savings, it simply went back to the investors. And I thought this was another nice cycle to look at. We had 47 million raised for a very explicit purpose. The purpose was not able to be fulfilled upon and the funds just simply reverted back to the investors through the same channel, right? So a much healthier way of raising, deploying, and then reversing when reality has something to say about our best intentions <laughs> um, and keeps everybody whole in the process. <clears throat> Which gets us closer to where we are today um, through 2023 and 2024. 2023, I found DAOs kind of went silent and they got um, shouted out by AI. I think AI won the, the media space and the mind space of everybody in innovation and pioneering efforts in 2023. I think AI will continue to own that space uh, in 2024. Those of, you, those of you that know me know that I am extremely bullish on artificial intelligence, large language models, and its impact on all of humanity. And 2023 was just the beginning. 2024 is gonna be a watershed. I don't know what's bigger than a watershed, but that'll be 2025, I am convinced. <laughs> and it's just gonna continue. Um, so, um, DAOs have kind of gotten a little quiet, but they're not going away. In fact, I could not be more bullish on what a DAO is and the rise of how I see and PowerShift Eco sees a PowerShift DAO operating as a for-purpose enterprise. And I'll explain what that looks like more concretely and why I'm so excited about that as a vision of the future for organizations or enterprises or 
the coordination of effort by humans. So this is kind of a, a timeline. Um, when I think of DAOs, I think of it along these lines. Um, I think of it as both a technology and um, a resource allocation, acquisition, and deployment tool. Um, and I still see it as quite immature as it's conventionally um, held and understood by most folks. So I'll let that just kind of sink in a bit. Maybe there's some questions or maybe you have a, um, another story, a little anecdotal story of your own experience with the DAO or DeFi's or ICOs, or maybe you want to quibble with my timeline. I'd be happy to <laughs> entertain that as well. Um, any thoughts on this timeline or your own experiences with DAOs? And I'm not seeing everybody's screen. So if you have hands up or thumbs raised or you're using some other indication or you're chatting, I'm not paying attention to chat either. Uh, so if you do have a question, just unmute yourself and jump right on in. I will throw out maybe just a quick uh, perspective. My approach has basically been to ignore DAOs because <laughs> I essentially have confidence that there are other people out there like yourself who are working on that. And so DAOs to me essentially are forming as a substrate or as a structure <clears throat> framework that eventually will be available almost to the point of WordPress for developing web websites uh, and that these things mm -hmm. are really normalizing at a higher rate of speed, which is interesting looking at your timeline there, um, yeah. that these models are really coming out. And that's kind of what PowerShift is, is doing as I see it is creating that framework so that we can just apply that to uh, whatever solutions we're trying to develop. Yeah, absolutely, Joshua. Um, your lips to God's ears, as they say, <laughs> we make it all just clickable. Uh, click, 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 and you've got a DAO going. And And really, who cares? Um, you know, it's just a thing that we I, use to express purposeful work. Yes, Boris. Oh, Boris, I heard you for a second. Maybe not. No, I don't see you, so I can't tell. Boris also um, is not there. Ah, there. Boris, are you, Because are, did you want to say something? Yeah, I actually wanted to say I, I I got lost for a second. That what Joshua was mentioning to a large extent is already available from a legal perspective and from an operational perspective. There are a few standard legal systems, legal structures for DAOs, including foundations and DAO LLCs. Not only in countries like US, but also for more institutional grade uh, applications in Singapore, or Switzerland, for simpler applications in again Panama or Marshall Islands. <clears throat> and uh, there are it is a bit worse with things like operating agreements for DAO. This is what the ANCO and Tom and we are developing, but there are some solutions for that as well. And from the technical perspective, there are also many solutions that allow for DAO treasuries and DAO voting like Aragon, like Gnosis. So I would say a basic stuff for DAO is uh, already available. What is lacking from my perspective is more granular solutions for governance within DAOs, for effective organization of work within DAOs. But I noticed working with, with, uh, within Polacracy and that the governance here is actually <clears throat> multi, multi layered and applied uh, with, uh, within not only a single large group of all members, but on different levels, level, levels by different groups. And the next step of developing DAOs to be more applicable is in reflecting this uh, multi-level governance of, of uh, real-world PowerShift organizations within uh, legal and technical frameworks <clears throat> of, of DAOs. But even now, I'd say to many cases, they are applicable. Yeah, well said. Um, so for the early adopters, um, the um, opportunity is to take the, the individual component pieces and parts and start building your own and playing with all the different ingredients. Um, it is uh, more difficult that way, but that's what we do, right? All of us really on, our, uh, on this call in our own ways are innovating and experimenting in our own areas, pushing boundaries of authority, um, and self-organization and self-management. So Boris is spot on. And in fact, I, it's a great segue. Thank you, Boris. I think my next slide will talk about um, the current hurdles. <clears throat> so um, it's not in the technology stack per se. 
it is actually much more in the business fundamentals. Where the immaturity still lies is in these four, four categories. And um, you'll see that these are the four things that the power shift ecosystem, uh, sociocracies, holacracy, teal, and other practices have been experimenting with in our living laboratory for well over a decade and a half. So where the DAOs are coming at it from maybe a tech stack towards business, we're coming at it from a business towards tech stack. And so for example, the legal and operational uh, challenges, um, this is huge, right? The lack of a, just the simple lack of a legal entity status in the early days through about 2019 and 20, meant it was really difficult, impossible really, to enter into a commercial contract because you didn't have a legal entity to do so. It was just an agreement loosely buying between the partners or uh, with no limits of liability. So unlimited liability uh, for all partners who connected their wallet to any project of any scale. Uh, this is enough to uh, if really examine closely. This should uh, drive away all investors to that kind of uh, business uh, structure. Um, the regulatory amb ambiguity right? The, all the regulators all over the world are still wrestling with, struggling with what to make of these creatures. And they're always going to be behind. I'm less worried about that. Um, but I'm more concerned that we, as a community, we as the, the pioneers, get clear on what it is that we want. And I think this is where um, ENCODE.org has made great strides in getting super clear on what we think a legally anchored regulatory compliant entity type is a for-purpose enterprise with a legitimate operating agreement that has been completely gutted and restructured to encode the power shift principles that we care about while still being compliant with existing systems. This allows us to straddle the old world and new world. And I think we have a lot to offer this community with our regulatory um, al alignment and our compliance and working within current legal structures. Um, related uh, securities concerns, this is still a moving target, but with Stobox help and with Boris's help, uh, the way we have danced this is instead of trying to force fit everything, um, you know, all you have is a, a hammer, everything looks like a nail, um, then we've looked at um, bringing different types of securities and non-securities. PSTX is not a security. It is a utility token that we expect to use as a fungible uh, way of um, accounting for value contributions by and between the constituent parts of the ecosystem. PowerShift Properties has a straight up security token, a Reg D compliant security token representing um, a security interest in short term real estate. And PowerShift Capital um, is soon to have an equity token representing a fractional. Um, stake in a portfolio of investment companies. And so we're playing with different, different forms of these cryptocurrencies. It's not like a one size fits all. We're not doing an ICO and claiming that it's not that. Uh, we're, we're tailoring and designing uh, tokens for the particular uses that we want. I think this is a characteristic of DAOs. DAOs, especially going forward in the future, um, there will be multiple types of currencies, multiple types of valuing um, different human interests at a local scale. Much to say about that. Um, and then the power dynamics. I think this is the, the one that really um, encourages me the most about what the power shift ecosystem has to offer. Um, all organizations that want to operate as DAOs suffer from this even the early adopters, even the mo most mature, because, you know, God bless them. What are you going to do when you're deploying all this amazing, emerging, leading edge, decentralized technology, but you don't know about distributed authority? You're still operating with a power hierarchy. You're still operating with a personal power hierarchy. Um, Josh and I, Josh and I, Joshua and I were at the Network State Conference, as you know, and one of the things that I was I would lead with when talking to some of the folks there is say, hey, I love your, your project and your initiative, your cabin, and all of the things you're doing. Do you still have a CEO? And it's really just that simple. Do you still have employees? 
in your decentralized structure? Those are two very simple questions that 99% of the time, the answer to those questions are yes, which belie the fact that they haven't shifted the fundamental operational structures to align with the other things that they're pioneering and innovating in. There's a, a misalignment. And so what we bring is the ability to align power structures, uh, distributed authority and decentralization operational structures to be aligned with the decentralized principles that we find in uh, DAOs from a technology stack um, and financial stack layer. So I think this is really, really important. There's a ton of hurdles that are preventing DAOs from scaling and really reaching their full promise as I see it. But promise they have, and I think, I don't wanna um, bury the lead, but uh, down a few slides, I will talk about um, the world I see and the, the role DAOs play in it. <clears throat> and then uh, to Boris's point, um, Thankfully, there are some leading jurisdictions all over the globe. Um, Boris mentioned several of these. I've spoken to the folks in Marshall Islands. Um, we almost had a, a emerging relationship with them, but they weren't ready to do the gutting of their foundation um, uh, legal agreement in the Marshall Islands to do the work that we did to incorporate the self-organizing self principles. Like, for example, uh, shifting the fiduciary to purpose. Like, for example, changing capital or equity um, interest into security tokens um, or many other things. Uh, or adopting a self-organizing system for um, operational uh, decentralization. So I, I've spoken with a couple of these. We've explored with others. And while they're innovating, um, they are, from a legal standpoint, if you look at their operating agreement and then their, really their operations methods, it's still very grounded in conventional hierarchical structures. So I, I think here we do have the opportunity, the PowerShift ecosystem honestly has a, a huge opportunity to pioneer and lead at the legal level. Um, we've already launched, as I've said, several Wyoming DAO LLCs. And to the extent we can, um, we can uh, achieve Joshua's vision of making this online, easy, clickable, click, 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 launch your Wyoming DAO LLC without giving much thought to it, then we have really something to offer at scale. Um, legal structures married with operational structures. So I see the world in three different buckets. There are three categories of DAOs. Um, there are the, what I would call the primordial DAO, like the DAO. That's uh, the purest. Um, you know, create a token, um, put it on a chain or create your own chain <laughs> in some cases. Um, invite anybody with a wallet to connect and um, capitalize uh, your project with the selling of those tokens. And then um, allow folks to do whatever in pursuit of whatever. <laughs> so it really is that vague. I, I, I've spoken with many folks um, who are operating a DAO, like Haifa, uh, the Seeds folks, and Jack DuRose, an old associate um, that started Colony, Colony.io. And there are a lot of stories about the upside of liberation of self-organization is you're free to, with agency, lead your work. We're really familiar with that mantra here, right? You have the agency to lead your work, but you that agency comes within a broader context of a game we play together to coordinate the effort needed to lead your work towards a purpose. Oftentimes what happens in these primordial DAOs is you arrive, you connect your wallet, and the, the person is excited and ready to go, said, I'm ready to work, what do I do? And the response is, whatever you want. As I, but what do I do? Well, whatever you think is needed, but how do I do that? Well, sometimes we have these proposals, propose something. And it's just, it's almost like back in the day when Brian and I were launching Holacracy, and we would start with uh, rollouts, with the clean slate rollout, uh, not seeding any tension or structure, 
um, we really, hum us humans, we really don't do so well with a clean slate like that. Need some sort of framework, some sort of boundaries to play within to frame up what it is uh, we're actually doing and how we contribute. So the primordial DAOs um, have um, lots of scalability for sure, um, but I don't think they're really feasible. I don't think they're viable structures going forward. They need much more. So enter the hybrid DAO. There have been a lot of players in the hybrid DAO space, IFA being one, um, many, many maker DAOs, all of these. Um, I think most of the the network state folks uh, projects would fit into this category too, at least be open to becoming a hy hybrid DAO. This is where there's um, legal anchor, as Boris was mentioning, there's a lot of good options on the table, institutional options that otherwise to legally anchor as a DAO, but you still have this millstone around your neck of conventional power and conventional operations. And unless you deal with that, you're always gonna be at odds between one power system, uh, legal and financial in this case, and the other power system, um, conventional power management hierarchy. And that's gonna bleed efficiency out of the system. And then while you still have wallet holders in a hybrid DAO, uh, connect your wallet, come play with us, and you might have a little bit more structure <clears throat> to how you're going to operationalize your work. You're still uh, dealing with the, am I an if I'm not an employee, what am I? And I'm calling this like a pseudo contract laborer. Uh, you're an independent worker with no real direction, but no real inclination to have a sense of community or bond with your other pseudo contract laborers. It may or may not happen, but there's no system there to really hold that and nurture that and cultivate that. So the hybrid DAOs, <clears throat> have a lot of complexity because they're dealing with multiple power systems um, and a hybrid identity, I think. So they face some interesting challenges as they're bridging between two worlds. And I do think, uh, of course, bias is fully showing here. I do think that the power shift ecosystem has the opportunity to present the power shift DAO as a synthesis where we have fully aligned legal, operational and people um, rules, this should sound like insanely familiar. We've been doing this since 2015, um, all integrated into a self-organized uh, system with really innovative financial instruments, uh, profit interest, capital interest, deferred interest, and dynamic equity allocation interests, all ready to go, already being practiced, um, already being exercised by a whole group of power shifters and purpose agents just mostly not on chain. And I think this is what's up for us next. The power shift DAO matures into migrating the rules that we have and the financial instruments that we have and the cultural um, rules that we have to be more on chain in the right way. The right things on chain and the right things off chain and not mixing the two. And I'll show you a little example of that here in a bit. So that's kind of how I see the, the world of DAOs into three buckets. The, the, the early, early ones, what I'll call the primordial DAOs, the hybrid DAOs, and emerging, hopefully, the power shift DAO. <clears throat> and then um, what we've done, I would say the advantages concretely, we have um, the smart contract itself is written into the operating agreement by virtue of these. Um, different jurisdictions all over the world recognizing um, this thing called a DAO, we're able to actually write the contract, the smart contract language into the legal agreement itself. I'll show you this as an example here in a second. And then we're able to use the right governance for the right situation, for the right tension. You've heard, all heard the, the crazy stories of DAOs where you have proposals, mostly uh, people are proposing things, but they're proposing operational things. Uh, just to put a, a silly uh, point on it, it's like proposing you know, buying a computer or buying office supplies or um, buying a subscription to a software product or whatever, and having to propose that through uh, governance uh, as an operational decision. So there's not a maturity of whole part or, or um, 
nested whole part decisions, like what belongs in the operational space versus what belongs in the governance space. And so with a for-purpose enterprise, we have do governance that allows for uh, glass frog integrative decision-making where it's needed and wallet voting where it's needed. And we get to bridge those two things together. And I'll show you an example of that as well, or at least a screenshot of it. <clears throat> as I said, we have uh, mature financial instruments that represent tried and true um, stress tested um, financial resources needed by entrepreneurs to start businesses. Everything from you know traditional capital interest to uh, paying people not salaries or W twos or even contract labor, but profit interest, profit interest aligned with purpose. Uh, being able to deal with the fact that sometimes you don't have the cash to pay what's owed, uh, and you need some sort of financial accounting for that. We have the deferred interest, and the ability to not play the predict and control startup partnership game of defining your cap table and your equity structure all up front but we have dynamic allocation or dynamic equity uh, units to track that. So we have a lot to offer and we have a whole group of us who are now accustomed to working not as employees, not really even as contractors per se with a contractor mentality, but as fully shifted purpose agents who are picking and choosing purposes that we care about and deciding how we wanna spend our time and our energy and our talent independent of any labor laws or any other um, constraining power structures. So I think these are the, some of the advantages of the, the power shift DAO. And then um, a lot on the screen, it's just an amalgam of four screenshots, honestly. If you look at um, the bottom left, <clears throat> you'll see this is a screenshot from the Wyoming DAO LLC operating agreement. And some of you have seen this agreement. I think we went through it a little bit in one of the, the earlier um, ecosystem series, but there's a whole bunch of defined terms. And I, I, I found it fascinating. It was like, I got a little giggle, a little chuckle when the Wyoming Dow LLC came out to see that there was actually a defined term for a smart contract in a legal agreement. I thought that was just like amazing that we're actually defining what a smart contract means and we're giving it a URL. It's actually a locator for the actual contract and the contract address. In this particular instance, we're using a third party platform um, called Snapshot <clears throat> to hold the contract. Um, in a more mature offering, we might actually have the contract address that's on chain, that's public. And interestingly, the Wyoming Dow legislator, legis legislature mandated in its amendment in 2022 that you must specify your smart contract designator in order to be considered a legitimate DAO LLC, which I think is fascinating. Uh, and it's certainly aligned with PowerShip pr principles because it means that your um, ledger of record is a public ledger of record um, filed when you incorporate with the secretary of state of whatever jurisdiction you're incorporating in, uh, making your smart contract um, known that's doing performing governance. I find that amazing. Uh, down on the bottom right is another screenshot of the operating agreement. And you'll notice this little uh, big disclaimer on the bottom. And I won't read the whole thing, but the first part, the rights of members, that's all of us, in a decentralized autonomous organization may differ materially from the rights of members in other limited liability companies. I love them. They're pointing out right in the operating agreement. This is required, by the way. This, this paragraph has to be there to be a legitimate Wyoming Dow LLC because the, legislatures know, the legislator knows that the way these things work are materially different than the way a conventional LLC works. And of course, we've known that because we've been playing the non-conventional LLC game for a very long time. So I love that. And then if you look at the bridge between, that's the bridge between decentralized autonomous organization structures and the law. And the top two are screenshots of how do we bridge between decentralized autonomous organization structures and governance. So on the right, you'll see, everybody should probably recognize that as a glass frog proposal. <clears throat> and this was for PowerShift properties as an example. Attention, we need to acquire some new properties. So the proposal is to 
So 700K worth of US, uh, 700 USD worth of PSPP for property acquisitions, maybe to do investors. And then we have a designator. We have a bridge between glass frog governance pointing to the blockchain proposal where that is being proposed in the smart contract system. So we have a bridge there. Glass frog governance, boom, over to the top left screenshot in a system called Snapshot which is a lightweight decision-making tool that allows you to configure a whole bunch of decision-making methodologies, including a one wallet, one vote method, which matches the integrated decision-making method perfectly. Instead of voting your shares or voting the amount of tokens you hold, you only get to vote with one vote per wallet. And that means that the Anchor Circle members get to do only two things. They get to either object or not object. And you get a proposal that has no objection all the way around. You have a adopted proposal, adopted and done, adopted, done, and written to the public ledger, right? So different than written to a database in Glass Frog, this is adopted, done, and written to the public ledger on the blockchain. Now, this is nascent. There's much better ways, much tighter ways, working with Glass Frog, the software company, to get tighter integration and working with different providers. Again, Boris mentioned several to actually have API calls to an actual smart contract to actually do this probably with our own dashboard. But this is representative of what you can do today. And I think this is also in the spirit of the PowerShift ecosystem. Um, you don't have to wait. This is all doable now. The pieces and the parts, the components are there. All we need are trepid explorers and experimenters ready to try this out and deploy your own DAO uh, with your own purpose and draw to it the resources you need, time, energy, and money, and let's go. The, 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 the world is waiting for a vastly more um, robust group of DAOs on the planet. Which brings me to the future. So for me, um, the way I see the world is every organization is a DAO. Every organization is a DAO. Uh, I hope we look back someday, quaintly, um, uh, we look back and think, oh my God, look at the structures we had that got us incredible things, but simply were collapsing under the weight of their own, uh, own power dynamics. And now with DAOs, they become points of purpose, each DAO a purpose. Uh, David Allen has so many quotes. One of him is, there are no problems in the world, only projects, in his, his mind. No problems in the world, just projects. I like to put a little spin on that. Not projects, but purposes. Only purposes in the world that need to be served. And if we have a multiplicity of purposes, all running in a self-organized, autonomous organizational structure at scale, then we have a vast network of DAOs that are expressing purposeful work into the world. So I want to see more of that. Organizations then simply become tools to express purposeful work. And then we individuals get the freedom to choose which of these purposes we serve. And our whole notion of organizations as being the place where human development and culture appear just naturally drops and goes away. Um, human development and culture um, coheres around something else, a community of like-purposed individuals who want to hang out together. And that means the labor shifts from being employees or W-2 contractors to independent power shifted agents of purpose all over the planet. So I'd like to see that <laughs> sooner than later um, and would love for folks who can see that vision or resonate with that to help us create more DAOs, more purposeful uh, endeavors in the world. And I believe that takes us to our breakout session. I had to mute myself. Yeah, Tom, thank you. Um, I don't know. I can, of course, only speak for myself. But even though, you know, I've been engaged with all of this, this was like, I was really mesmerized in listening to your story. So thank you uh, so much. And uh, I hope uh, lots of questions are going to be coming up. But for now, um I would like to invite you to a, uh, let's say, 10-minute breakout group. And um, oh, 
Hi, Brithi. And uh, um, I'm going to add you to a breakout group once I've sent everybody out. So for 10 minutes, what did you what did you learn? What did you what did you what surprised you? What questions came up? And then let's dive deep into the questions. So enjoy 10 minutes. Um, enjoy and uh, over to the breakout groups. Welcome. Welcome back, everybody. I hope you enjoyed your sharings and your conversations. And uh, the floor is all yours now with your questions. Just one, please. Uh, one, one thing I would like to ask you is if you want to, if you have a question or a comment or something to share, please um, use the raise hand <clears throat> possibility down in the bottom where it says reactions and then raise hand because then Zoom helps me. It automatically rolls you from the left to the right in, in the sequence that you actually raised your hands. So that would be really helpful. And um, we have some raised hands already. Awesome. And Ruth, over to you. <clears throat> So Tom, you might have spoken to this already, but this is a new realm for me and I'm a little, I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. I don't understand mm -hmm. the financial part of the legal and the financial side of this are like, I just, it feels like a Greek to me. Um, and I'm noticing as I'm around more people who are thinking this way, that there seems to be a huge gap between the ability to have enough funding for these ideas and like there's a lot of people doing the work inside the new structures without the funding to like actually pay people well or themselves um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. or get their project off the ground. So I'm curious. <laughs> Sounds like every entrepreneurial endeavor I've ever been associated exactly. with. Exactly. <laughs> so I feel like you're saying something that might address that, but I'm missing some puzzle. I don't even know. I don't have a distinct question, but. It's called a no, trust. It's a... You're not familiar with this? It's called a, a, a trust, trust fund. <laughs> so, no, very yeah, good. Exactly. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, DAOs are not magic bullets, um, contrary to what they kind of looked like <laughs> maybe back in 2016, 17, and 18, when they were raising multiple millions uh, seemingly overnight. But that's just um, irrational exuberance, as they say. That comes and goes in any market with any financial instrument used to raise capital. Um, DAOs are not magic bullets for capital raises, although it will appeal to yet another investor segment those that do want to see scalable, uh, decentralized, uh, fully transparent transactions um, memorialized on a public ledger, blah, 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 you know, the story, the, the blockchain story. You'll find investors who want to invest in those kinds of things. So you get access to a whole different class of investor in addition to other investors to source capital, to start companies, to start purposeful endeavors. So, um, and then, you know, the, the types of financial instruments really don't change. There's, um, I, we could be very concrete, you know, PowerShift Properties launched as a Wyoming Dow LLC. And it launched with a um, early round for scaling operational capital. And it used a security token. PSPP is a security token that Stobox, the company uh, that Boris co-founded, um, helped us to design and create the to tokenomics and the regulatory structure for. And that token lives on the Polygon blockchain. And we have investors that surrendered a few hundred thousand of their dollars in exchange for PSPP, a blockchain-based security token representing a fractional ownership stake in short-term real estate. So that could have been done with a traditional paper instrument. And it's done all the time in the form of a REIT, a real estate investment trust, or any other fractional ownership of real estate, been done forever. It's not new in that regard, but it's using new financial instruments that do hold promise. There's some advantages with using these financial instruments over traditional financial instruments. Fungibility, liquidity, uh, potentially, uh, and all kinds of other things that are in, of interest. So it allows you to tell another story. I think a more compelling story, obviously, um, mm -hmm. to investors who want to see a more decentralized world and use financial instruments that are fully aligned with that decentralized world. So that's the new bit. It's a different story to tell for a different type of investor to fund purposeful, uh, purposeful endeavors. 
All right. Thanks. But, Gross. but by that description. Yeah, Oh. Sorry, I, I was I was just going to ask. So essentially, by that description, the understanding then is that the the <clears> time <throat> and the energy and the money necessary to build the the organization in the structures that 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 you're suggesting are are essentially done so with the assumption or with the belief that that an investor will uh, essentially assume the risk of the hybrid organization. Uh, as as a part of the investment, mm -hmm. so you're essentially investing in, you know, your own belief that structuring an organization this way is more compelling and more appealing, you know, to to the investor that you're seeking, essentially. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that's true for every enterprise in the PowerShift ecosystem. So I'll give you another case in point. Um, Encode.org uh, was capitalized with um, 2.3 million USD worth of D units. Uh, deferred interests, right? And so it is a classic um, financial instrument that is currently not on blockchain yet, but it operates in a fully decentralized way because it's described in the operating agreement as a decentralized financial instrument, right? So it almost doesn't matter necessarily what the instrument is, but the trend is to move more things to be defined, not in a paper operating agreement, but in a software smart contract. That's the beauty, right, of blockchain. You can write the legal agreement as a contract representing the financial instrument, a D unit, and have that live on the blockchain. And that allows you to tell a different story. But that didn't stop ENCODE from identifying, self-identifying as a fully decentralized autonomous organization formed in 2015, right? <clears throat> Just not on chain. All right, thank you. So uh, I saw your question, Vriti. So we'll have uh, Joshua and then uh, Boris, and then we'll come over to your question. Joshua, over to you. Hey, this might be a good segue into Vriti's question also. Um, but I think uh, one thing we discussed, of course, and as you laid out in the timeline is, is the numerous failures and disasters and the hype around DAOs. Uh, and so I think one of the big things that you're kind of offering and that I really speak to very often is the DAO in itself, just like crypto or AI or these terms that become very popularized are really just kind of elements within this larger organizational ecosystem, right? So there's a function, it serves a function. The question is, how do we integrate this um, effectively with the financial elements, with the, you know, as a governance element, with the actual operational elements, with the human resource management systems, with the purpose and with your organ, all the elements that an organization needs. And so I think part of the path that I see you taking that I really try to speak to is like, this is just one piece of that larger system, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of everyone mm -hmm. leaning on the DAO is, oh, the DAO is the solution. This is not the same, no. this is not the Messiah. This is a piece mm -mm. that helps. And I think by laying that out as an element that integrates with all these other systems, um, that, that becomes a lot more of a tangible approach there. Yeah, it goes back to my opening comment. Uh, DAO is really an ill-formed term. It really is not really suited for its task. It doesn't really define what we're trying to accomplish here, in my opinion. Uh, most people collapse it to something on the blockchain or something on um, a, a currency or a token. And that is not my vision of a DAO. My vision of a DAO is a replacement for organizations as we know them today. And all the things that go on in an organization to keep it a healthy organization pursuing purpose. And in our language, that's an enterprise that mm -hmm. adequately integrates the three necessary things needed to express purposeful work, capital, legal liability, uh, mitigation, operational processes, and labor. That in its entirety is an enterprise and a DAO can do all of those things and as much of it as possible on chain, um, but it's not um, in its current form, not as it's defined or held in its current form. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Tom. So there's a conversation going on on the chat here. So maybe you can bring it together here. Uh, Boris, you have your hand raised. Yes, I actually wanted to reply to previous comment by uh, Mackenzie regarding, uh, re regarding regarding investor risk. And 
a curious point on that is one of the reasons at least for me why I would like uh, power of capital to be successful and maybe devote a bit more attention to that is to actually demonstrate that uh, purpose equity uh, purpose equity can deliver higher conventionally financial return than traditional equity that this self-organization because of reduced overhead reduced the uh, opportunity cost of the overhead because of higher intrinsic motivation and uh, adaptability can actually lead to higher returns compared to traditional entities uh, and therefore investing in a hybrid organization isn't actually an increased <clears throat> risk for investors. Obviously, most investors, <laughs> uh, many investors would disagree with that, and there are good reasons to uh, to believe in such a way, because poorly implemented self-organization can be an increased risk. But in this case, it isn't the self-organization in general, and uh, if you look at as a risk, but just poor management or poor, poor organization or structure as a risk, which is a risk that you have both in traditional and self-organized entities. So I believe with open-minded investors, there is possibility to have such a conversation and they would be open, especially if you present evidence from your current operations, they would be open to an idea that uh, su such a way of operating is more effective. But you are right in saying that this does limit a total pool of investors. And this is something we do have to accept, at least at this point. And this is why I believe PowerShop.io has to focus on doing broad marketing for self-organization as an idea in general, why one of the things we want to do is the marketing development fund is so that these ideas are more broadly distributed. And therefore, when each of you and everyone mm -hmm. wants to operate at least to remotely in the soft organization space, each of you faces slower barriers. So that's why doing things like powers of capital and broader marketing for the idea is and doing more research as to scientific and uh, evidence data as to how such a way of running organizations can be more effective is something that we probably should devote significant attention to. Well said. Beautiful. So, Vritti, um, um, you raised the question. I know Boris answered, but uh, over to you. Yeah, I, I don't think I'm necessarily looking for for tax answers. I mean, you, you guys are not, you know, tax advisors. That's not fair to, <laughs> fair to ask or legal advisors. I think my point in saying all of that was that um, really what Boris just said, which is it does limit the scope of the audience because the layman who doesn't quite understand any of this is going to be, feel pretty reticent to sort of engage. And so the, the pathway that we've taken is let's create as many web to feeling like sort of ecosystems and, and structures so that people can feel really comfortable with it. But on the back end, sort of like have Web3 ecosystems sort of running and the principles, which Tom very, you know, beautifully named earlier, you know, the concept of, um, you know, self-sovereignty and democratization and, and all that, like we really need to embed that into organizations. And so if we lead with the principles and we lead with um, user friendly interface, then on the back end, we can continue sort of like, you know, running the DAO ecosystem. Um, we are trying to figure that out right now. We haven't yet. And so um, this has been super helpful. Mm. Lovely. Beautiful. Lovely Thank fellow you. intrepid explorer. <laughs> Am I pronouncing your name correctly, Vriti? Hmm. Yeah, you All got right. it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay, Joshua, over to you. Yeah, just piggybacking off that again, like my approach has been, and I think this is kind of uh, where the PowerShift properties comes into play within the PowerShift ecosystem. Uh, my approach is to very subversively introduce these revolutionary concepts, right? So when I'm talking about any blockchain, anything like that, usually with investors, and of course, every investor is a different audience, but usually I just say, oh, we have a, you know, an advanced software layer that manages these systems. Or like uh, Tom was speaking to Encode, where you built the organization to function this way, but you really were just using traditional uh, investment vehicles to kind of get that get it started and get those things moving in that way. So I think the <clears throat> challenge is maintaining that vision for how we're trying to build this and what we're building <clears throat> into, and then trying to figure out how to sneak it in there with kind of the more traditional inside the box thinking uh, that leads us to the place where we can actually really deploy it where we want to. Yeah, lovely. Um, I do like that a lot about straddling the fence because it allows you to tell two versions of the story, the web two or the conventional and the web three post-conventional. And the four-purpose enterprise has everything familiar. 
to every investor that's invested in any LLC over the last many decades. They're full on legal members with they participate in a partnership and a limited liability. They file taxes with as a limited liability partner. They have capital interests that work like capital interests um, work in a partnership. Um, they have all the foundational elements that are very familiar. We might just add the Web3 twist to um, operationalize, if you will, a capital interest, not as a piece of paper, but as a piece of technology. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. So I can still see there's this conversation between Vritti and, <laughs> and Boris going on. Um, mm -hmm. Anything that you guys <laughs> want to share or comment on further? Of the conversation that has been going on. All right. Boris, you want to say something? Yeah, we were continuing the topic of uh, adopt of adoption and making it uh, participation in, in self organization and DAOs and crypto easier for broad audiences. And uh, we probably, we, we, I guess, agree that this is uh, here we are aligned with interest of incumbents because everyone in crypto wants the experience to be easier and there is a lot of work being done on technologies like account obstruction for example that uh, would make it easier and was on, uh, on from regulatory side on creating clear rules for filing taxes related to crypto and obviously it, it, i guess we can imagine turbo tax or other solutions adding streamlining payment of taxes in crypto at some point in future so i believe this is just a matter of time, and obviously we should try to alleviate isolated pains in the short term, in the medium term, not even in the long term. This is, uh, I believe, problems that will be solved when it comes to a technical and legal sides. The problems that won't be solved by others is easy onboarding in self-organization specifically, especially for people who work for a very long time in uh, traditional roles and traditional organizations. This is, I believe, the unique point that has to be addressed specifically by us, by, again, powers of people and guilds, that we would be doing maybe by uh, some other solutions. I'm not that well familiar with the overall work being done in this space. And this is probably, probably the unique growing pain that uh, we can address on our side that won't be done by other players, uh, <coughs> other ecosystems. <clears throat> All right, thank you, Boris. Okay, no hands up. Did anything come up just now? It would be cool to hear. Hmm? Go ahead. It would be cool to hear perspectives of uh, people on this call if you have any regarding how to approach the market of DAOs. The least, if we would be approaching them with uh, presenting them uh, collaboratively and partnership as tools for building better DAOs, operating DAOs better, how would we do actually use it on profit in terms of? Who would we reach out? What that solution would be in terms of value proposition, uh, etc. Would really love to hear your perspectives. Okay, Joshua, you have your hand up, and then over well, to you, I Joshua. I think uh, we are doing a lot of what uh, maybe Thomas can relate to, which is missionary work. We are uh, <laughs> out there advocating. <clears throat> Uh, we're right now working with Build Ecosystem, uh, Unit, and a lot of other projects to host uh, meetups across the country in cities all over the country where there are populations who are interested in this. And so I think <clears throat> a lot of this is to go out and to really preach the message of this can be done now. This is really at the core of what we're trying to present is that we have no uh, barriers to actually start working towards these solutions and employing them. And so a lot of the key, I think, is to be able to make projects and uh, <clears throat> case studies, use cases, aware that these solutions are here, and then connect them with the resources that are actually providing the solutions there. So it's a lot of it is getting the word out there, making people aware that there are solutions available and connecting them to those resources, and then letting that ecosystem flourish. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you, Joshua. Okay, uh, Riti. Uh, I have a slightly different uh, perspective. I think because of capitalism and because there is such an influx of uh, money to uh, you know tech companies and things like that, m more powerful organizations are actually becoming more closed than they are open because they're able to sort of like control the market with their sort of ability to 
you know, make more money and things like that. And so this concept of creating open systems and open societies that are distributed is actually more on the sort of grassroots level um, and more in marginal, marginalized communities. And so um, I wonder if, you know, you do want to spread this message. It's not through uh, necessarily sort of like, you know, top down organizations that probably are not going to shift their, their methods if like they're continuing to make profit. It's more like the middle tiered and the lower tiered organizations that are trying to figure out how to, uh, you know, help the planet or, you know, do social good or do things that are sort of more inclusive of society that are focusing more on regenerative systems are the ones that would be more open to these ideas. And then the second thing is not to lead with a DAO, right? Um, no one knows what a DAO is still. Um, you know, I talk about DAOs and no one, you know, in the education that feel like nobody knows what it is. And so we don't lead with the DAO. We are called a DAO, but we lead with the concept of democracy. And, you know, um, one thing we often like to say in the education world is, you know, an education for all is an education by all, which basically means that we all need to contribute to it, right? And so I would say that like leading with the, the, the <laughs> words and messages that most appeal to the principles and the mindsets and not necessarily the sort of like technical infrastructure or the like abbreviations or semantics that like we know so well in Web3. Um, and that, that's just my experience. Thank you for your perspectives. Thank you. This is super useful. Okay. So we're heading to the, the bottom of the hour. Uh, Tom, anything you would like to say um, at, at, to finish this round? Uh, no, just thanks for all the questions and the engagement. It's been a lot of fun um, hanging out with you guys as usual. And the, the words that echo in my mind over and over again is, um, don't wait, there's nothing in the way. <laughs> um, the waiting on energy is the bane of us all. Um, start <laughs> the entrepreneurial spirit. There's plenty to experiment with. And there's plenty of us, all of us on the call and many, many more uh, willing to help each other um, in our endeavors to experiment. Great. Thanks a lot, Tom. So for me, all there remains is to say thank you. Um, this was really inspiring also to listen to all your uh, comments and questions. Um, and uh, I don't yet have a next date for uh, PowerShift Ecosystem Series Episode 6, but you know, you're going to hear from us um, probably fairly soon. So this is goodbye for today. And hopefully see you all next time. And uh, <clears throat> thank you. Yes. And the recording, you'll get the recording link and you'll also get the slides. And um, and then we'll see you again next time here. All right. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.